I used to do lots of things. I used to do things and I'd say things and Jesus I was evil. Say things and break things and Jesus I was evil. I never shook babies. All right. Welcome everyone to the latest episode of the Reckless Muse Cast. Um, we got a special guest. We got Judson Vereen here. Uh, Judson, um, you're a talented artist. You're a graphic designer. You've dabbled in film. You've dabbled in a whole bunch of interesting things. Um, thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the, the projects that you've done? Um, well, primarily, uh, I'm a painter. Mm. So that was um, sort of my... Uh, my first, uh, my first love is where I decided I'd be an artist, sort of, I say, um, something like something, uh, I'll never really retire from. Mm. So as a painter, I, uh, that sort of geared my, my lifestyle in a sense. Um, I dropped out of high school when I was 16 and that's, I'm, I'm um, moved to New York city and, um, kind of uh, became a, a bohemian in a sense. And um, where are you from? Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, Atlanta. Okay, cool. Yeah. Where, where Could you still uh, afford to be a bohemian in the city at that time? How long ago was that? Well, I moved to New York City in 2000 and four i believe and i lived mm. in uh Bed bedford stuyvesant yeah bed -Stuy, <clears throat> which is apparently a lot different now i haven't been back since um and uh what was the question could you really afford it um well i guess you would kind of be a bohemian anywhere really mm. <laughs> i mean <laughs> yeah if, if uh affording it is your uh your uh, thing, then I don't know. Um, no, I, uh, I I spend most of the time sort of by myself. Um, I didn't even really have a computer. You know, so, I didn't bring a computer. So I, you didn't go to? Did you go to? Like, you didn't go to art school or anything like that? No, I mean, I uh, <clears throat> I did go to a pre-college program in New York City. Um, it was the um, the School of Visual Arts. And I was uh, something like a, I guess I would have been a sophomore. And it was the sort of thing where you, you know, you go and you live in the dorms and you experience the, the urban college campus mm. and uh, you go to classes and you sort of mimic, you know, and they want you to come to the school. And so, um, so I, I did that for like, I think it was like a three week program. And uh, I just really disliked it mm. a lot, but I love New York city. Right. So uh, there was sort of, uh, you know, a love affair with the city, but not with the structure. I had, I had already had it with school. I was sort of already out the door in some ways. So What's, what specifically about the, uh, the academic side kind of put you off? Well, in general, I had a tough time in school. I was not a very good student. Right. Um, and so I had gone uh, for several years to a, a public school. And then I went to um, this private school in Georgia called the Woodward Academy. And it was a, 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 a relic of the Georgia Military Academy. So we wore uniforms. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> People called each other by their last names. Still a very a uh, military style bent to the education. Mm. And uh, I uh, just sort of used every opportunity I, I could to rebel. I never really believed in it in a sense. Um, there was a little bit of culture shock there with the uh, private school having to wear a uniform and being with kids who had, you know, a lot more money and, and, and they have different attitudes and different cultural signals and different haircuts and um, all sorts of things. So uh, I was really put off by it because I couldn't really ever uh, get along naturally 
with that crowd and I tried, but um, they had a really good art program for, for a fairly conservative place. They had a, a, an incredible um, arts building with great materials and great instructors. And um, I suppose I had dug too deeply maybe into the old black and white photos of uh, the abstract expressionists and uh, you know, people like uh, Willem de Kooning and Mark Rothfield in their studios. And I just figured, you know, why not just sort of make it hard? I guess I, it looked fun. It seemed like once that idea got into my head, I really couldn't uh, do without it. So I thought I'd just take the plunge. And um, I guess I was just disenchanted with the idea. I never bought into the premise. I never liked a college team and I never had, you know, those types of aspirations. It never really made sense. Right, so I, right. there's something in the back of my head that thought this might be bullshit. Right. This might yeah. not really be what so many people are thinking it is. It can't be actually, it couldn't be just based on this idea of getting good grades and sort of keeping your mouth shut and then, you know, white picket fence in your late twenties and so on and so forth, retirement, whatever. Right, right. So one of the things I want to talk about is your art style, which Ben and I love. It's It's got like, like this really cool, like there's expressionism, there's some surrealism, there's like all yeah. this really rugged imagery in it that I love. Um, how would you describe your, 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 your creative style? Well, there's definitely um, some rugged, some ruggedness there. It's um, probably uh, just um, a constellation of, of the art that I like and that I like to see. Mm. Um, I want to see more of that um, just for myself. I mean, there's an old phrase that uh, every painter starts off as a collector. <clears throat> They don't mean that you're collecting other people's art. They mean that you are building your own collection of things that maybe you've seen elsewhere and building um, a repertoire based on on, on uh, your influences. <clears throat> yeah, so, I can see that. I can see that too with writing. Like, so I, I, I'm a writer, and I was very right. uh, excited by your book covers because I, I even follow like book cover porn you know, Reddit account or whatever. And they, they I, I get very uh, Ralph Steadman feel from a, a lot of your covers. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think that's really cool. I love that style. I always have. I mean, I loved his work on, um, uh, obviously yeah. fear and loathing, right. He yeah. did a ton of, yeah, did a ton of Hunter S. Thompson. The, um, right. And, Thompson and, and that's, that, that's the first thing I saw. And, um, you know, for so a couple of things I wanted to kind of uh, equate to to writing. So the first, going back to your upbringing, you, you said school isn't really for you. For writers, or I've heard now I don't do either of these things, but you either try and do an MFA program or you move to New York City, and it seems like you pick the latter works for you. I'm um, now I, right. I go to New York City pretty often. I live in New Jersey. Right. Uh, I have a lot of friends. My girlfriend lives there, so I'm there pretty often. But I don't I don't live there. Uh, but like for some people, that's just the route to go some people say it's actually better like don't go to writing program just go move to new york um so i could see definitely that's going to shape your experiences and your work and i think what you were saying also is like a lot of people i think and i started writing at a pretty young age then i stopped for a while then you realize like you need to really have some experiences to have things to write about uh painting i don't know if it's the exact same uh, i'm artistically challenged but uh, for for writing, like you really need to have some experiences to work off of because while I don't believe in the mantra necessarily of like write what you know, I think you should be able to write whatever you want. Usually the better work is what you know, just because it's coming from a different place. Right. Um, so is that is that kind of what you were getting at with your, as an artist, like you're collecting things, like you're collecting experiences that then you put onto canvas or, or whatever it is. Later. Well, I meant like you're more of a copycat. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. And I think writers do that too with like copying styles. Like I know I went through, I, I told myself when I was like 20, probably 24, 25, I'm like, I'm going to write just like Hemingway, like very simple to the point, no fluff, any of that. Yeah. I really, that's really not me. Like that's not yeah. how I like to write. So you are kind of testing things out. And I would think, 
I don't I don't know if I necessarily have a style. I guess I do, but I would think like my first novel does sound different than my fourth right now. But I don't know. And I know a lot of artists. I mean, I think the most common would be like people know about Picasso. Like you go through phases. He had his blue phase, his rose phase, his cubist cubist phase. So yeah. did you did, did that happen with you? Like do you kind of stick to a style and then grow out of it or just just consciously decide to leave it and try something else? Or is it more natural than that? No, it's something that I, I struggle with from an aesthetic standpoint. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. You mentioned Ralph Steadman, so, you know, uh, Hunter S. Thompson. And then yep. you mentioned Hemingway. You know, Hunter S. Thompson used to type Hemingway's novels out word for yeah. word just to and get the rhythm. Yeah, so I think 22. That's, yeah. that's almost sort of what I'm going for. I want to mm -hmm. know what it's like to assemble something like a Rauschenberg, <clears throat> a collage. Mm -hmm. I want to... <laughs> paint a, a, a cubist um owl you know yeah. in the style of picasso so yeah. <clears throat> there's a, a lot of copying actually hmm. and um that fits into the process in a very much longer timeline um i think a, springing off of that idea i think a lot of people put perhaps too much um, too much weight in, in originality. I think it's overrated. Um, of course, it's, it's a good idea and it, it sounds good, but when the pendulum swings too far into the originality idea, you, you get people who think they're forced to find something original and that originality seems forced and seems chosen rather than a natural consequence of fleshing out your curiosities about the medium. Mm. And so if you can imagine Hunter S. Thompson sitting there and copying, um, you know, Hemingway just to get the rhythm, I would say that's, that's my frame of mind as well in some of the paintings that I do, but mm. I've had a lot of influences. And so I really sort of uh, drive myself towards them in a way to paint yourself through them. So you can put the curiosity down and say, okay, I've, I've learned that lesson. How can I apply it to something else and move mm. on? So I think that originality is something that probably happens too early for a lot of people and they get stuck, particularly painters who are represented by galleries right. because now you're in a system of commerce. And there's an sure. expectation of, of consistency. Right, right. Yeah, the originality thing is interesting to me because um, I think you're absolutely right where, you know, when you're trying to pursue originality for its own sake, I, I actually think that, that being original isn't that difficult, but, there, but you also have to have some kind of craft like behind it. It's like it, it, otherwise you're, it's just masturbatory. Look, look at this crazy thing that I can do. It's like, well, anybody can do that. Um, yes. and, and I love the idea of working towards originality. And even if you're starting off emulating, you know, the people that you admire, the artists that you admire, um, you know, you go, you go through that phase in your formative years, but at some point as you start to grow, you start to develop taste. You start to say, like, okay, I like this person's style, but I don't really like what they're doing over here. What if I were to do it my own way? What if I were to use that mm. as a jumping point into this other thing over here? Then it becomes like more of like a natural uh, progression towards like, like, like a true authentic voice as an artist. Right, right. I mean, you take these lessons and you, you put them together. And if you're lucky, you come up with something original at some point, maybe you can stick with it. Right. But there are artists who sort of do the exact opposite of, of Picasso. I mean, once Mark Rothko hit his stride as a painter, clearly he wasn't uh, all that interested in uh, reinventing the wheel, right. you know, and neither was, was someone like Pollock. Um, there are certain artists who hit that type of stride and they have found something, um, a, a mode of expression that they can um, exhaust over a long period of time. And that's uh, a gift in a sense, but not likely to be the case. Um, and you, you think of, you know, musicians too. I mean, one of my favorites is Bob Dylan and he's had about probably 10, you know, distinct you know bob dylan's you know that are just you know completely different um and 
when you see someone making art over a long period of time, that's, um, that's even, even more impressive, that sustainability of creative outbursts, creative output that they just had to reinvent themselves. They just couldn't do it anymore. Hmm. Right. What can I, because you brought up Jackson Pollock, do you have an opinion on more abstract art? I'm primarily an abstract painter. Mm -hmm. Most of my work is at, is is based on pure abstractions. Um, so, you know, I mean, I I, I love ab abstract art. I mean, I think that's okay. where the uh, that's where the true grit is, in some ways. Um, so, what do you think when like when people see because the the classic line is always you know, my eight year old could do that. Right. If they see like, <laughs> yeah. like some abstract art, it'll just be like uh, a bunch of, I forget this is in a movie. I forget which one it was, but the art is just like red blocks, not blocks, yeah. but like red, just like canvas, let's say four feet. And there's just red and there was a bunch of them. Right. I mean, do you, do you not think there's any sort of like, what's the term? Like not fraudulent, but do you like what would as an artist do you look at that and, and and see a deeper meaning or you just think it, it's lazy? Um, probably neither. Uh, but I I mean I, I get what you mean. Of course, I, I walk into galleries all the time and see things that I think are borderline fraudulent. I mean that, yeah. that happens. Okay. That's that's usually what does happen. Hmm. Um. Hmm. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I don't know if that's the right word I'm trying to come up with. I don't know, like fraudulent, but not. I mean, we were just talking about on an episode before Joe the uh, gold cube. Oh yeah, yeah. In Central Park. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I don't know, Judson, if you're familiar with this, the the gold cube that was in Central Park. Uh, I, it's like made out of pure it, gold. It's just it's, a cube. It's yeah. just a cube, but it's made out of gold. I don't know if there was some statement to be made there, which is fine. Like that's cool. I don't think there was. Um, if there was, wouldn't you put it on like Wall Street or something? Like I, I don't know, yeah. like some some sort of uh, populist capitalist statement, something like that. But I, I, I guess the point where, and I love like one of my favorite things to do in the city, especially is go to museums. When I travel to other cities, other countries, go to museums. I was just at the the, the MoMA. I mean, that's probably one of my like that's one of my favorite. I think that kind of like 50s, like, no, it's like 30s through 70s, a lot of like French and Italian artists, like some of my favorites. Modigliani is probably my favorite artist. Mm -hmm. um, but there, and and I do like some abstract art. I am into, uh, like, I like Jackson Pollock. Uh, but I, there is a lot to me that's just, it, it's really, well, the critics decided it's good, so now it's worth a lot. And, and I do think right. that other art, there's more objective. Uh, like, I think people will look at when I will use Picasso and I don't think a lot of people can deny that a lot of like Guernica is a gorgeous, brilliant painting, even right. if it's not really your style where with abstract art. As well as a, 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 a big statement as yes. well. You know, oh, absolutely. Mean, yeah. With political, you know, you know, obviously. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, for, you know, a little context, I mean, Pure abstraction was something that happened primarily in America. I mean, this was a, a, a partly a result of the American ingenuity and the, let's say, the, um, the effect of the individual. Um, you can, anyone can come to America and make it in a sense. And there's a lot of pressure put on in, on the individual in that way, and so all throughout art history, from you know, look at any other um, art movement from Art Nouveau to the Impressionist period to Cubist. I mean, you have these um, these phrases that will describe any of the paintings. Impressionism, they all are employing a similar tactic. That's what impressionism means. Cubist, they all employ cubist tactics. And so abstract expressionism was different in the way that a Mark Rothko 
is as different from a Jackson Pollock as you could possibly get. Mm. They, were, they weren't bound by um, aesthetic principles, more um, in some way a, a, a stream of consciousness psychological type principle, but they weren't bound by, by a style. And so there's a, there's a celebration of the individual there, a rebelliousness in a sense. Um, and so that would lead to a lot of personalized um, interpretations through abstraction. <clears throat> but what people, people tend to not be very familiar with abstract art. One is that it's harder to look at. It takes much more time. The same way maybe very few people have the patience for classical music sure. from a broad pop culture standpoint. Sure. Right. So it takes a little bit longer looking. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> it takes a little bit longer looking. And <clears throat> we've been out of that phase for a long time. The public is actually so behind on where art is. You could show the public a de Kooning from 1942. And they would say, oh, those crazy kids in New York City, what are they going to yeah. do next? It's like, well, that was almost 100 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not the public's fault. Right. Um, there's long been a, a rivalry between the artist and the, and, and the, the, the worker. The um, uh, art was something that rich people collected, and it's what mm. clever people in New York City uh, made. And so mm. uh, for a lot of people, art is what happens in the big fancy cities so millionaires can decorate their apartment with um, big red blocks. Right. So there's a little bit of a cultural yeah. uh, butting of the heads, particularly when they realize those three red blocks sold for $81 million at auction. Right? Yeah. To me, it feels like, like, I think, uh, I think a lot of it's money laundering. And, <laughs> and I think that's next with like NFTs is like, that's what's going on. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, there's a way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's long been a, been a, a curiosity or a, um, yeah, an idea that people hide their money through the thing. And I'm sure they do. I'm sure yeah. they do. Hey, that's, <laughs> well, I mean, the artist makes out. That, that, yeah. I, I'm, we're, we're pro that. We're yeah. pro artist. <laughs> yeah, we're pro I mean, artist here. At the same time, I'm I'm grateful for it, but <clears throat> it is the type of extravagance that can't really be explained other than through the type of things you're talking about. You know, with laundering and and uh, or 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 an honest investment strategy. Um, yeah. it's. It's hard. I mean, the thing that you should probably, the thing that I remind myself of is that it's worth nothing. Mm. It's worth zero. You can start with that. Right. If you're a painter. It's like, <laughs> I, I mean, it is like as kind of as pure market capitalism as you can get is, is a piece of art because the market decides to the dollar, like how much it's worth, what someone's willing to pay for it. And, you could, you know, you could think it's the greatest thing ever or like a piece of junk and it's who's willing to buy it. And then the demand, yeah. well, I mean, that's why everyone always says, you know, once an artist dies, the demand goes up because there's not going to be any more so-and-so's work. Right. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's pretty pure in that sense, which, which I appreciate. Um, <laughs> and I, I do think that's very cool. And that's where it doesn't work out for the artist so much, which kind of sucks. Uh where yeah. you know, when they die, their work increases in value exponentially. Right. Um, yeah, it all gets it all gets very strange, and it's if 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 you're an artist and and you feel weird about someone buying one of your paintings for millions of dollars, it's a good problem, I guess. <laughs> it's yeah. not, it's, oh, totally. it's uh, not something you, most of us have to worry about. Yeah. Right. Have you guys seen that movie, uh, Velvet Buzzsaw? So it's I Netflix. Guess, yeah. No, um, we, we've talked about that. I should see it. It's Jake Gyllenhaal, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a horror. Yeah, yeah. It, it I'm going to watch that soon, actually. 
And it's kind of a dark comedy. I, I thought it was just okay. I, I didn't think it lived up to, I, like, I thought it made some interesting, you know, critiques of the art world, particularly in LA. But there was one funny scene where, like, this very oh, yeah. pretentious, uh, 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 like, uh, uh, gallery owner, I think, um, and he goes to, to John Malkovich's character's, uh, uh, his art studio, and uh, he, just to check up on his progress, John Malkovich plays an artist, and so, so he goes to his studio, and then he sees, like, a pile of garbage and then the, like the, the guy looks at it and he goes, "Oh, it's beautiful, it's sublime." And then Malcolm just goes, "That's last week's garbage." <laughs> but it's just, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's but you know, it's like I know it's meant to be you know funny, but it is sort of that thing where it's like, the, like you, know, the average person looks at you know certain pieces of art and goes, "Why the fuck would anybody pay that much money?" Like you know, for example, there was that um, uh, a couple years back, somebody duct tape a banana peel. A, a banana to a wall yeah. and some big thing and then it sold for like 27 grand or something and then somebody ate the banana and then it was just sort of like i don't know man <laughs> yeah that was one of, the, one of the biennales maybe venice or i don't remember it was one of the big art it was uh it was a big art fair so yeah. there was a yeah. lot of press for something like that yeah. but yeah those are the type of the banana on the wall is what you might call a parlor trick <clears throat> it, there, you can see that it could only be thought of as anything from a concept as as a concept, right. meaning there's no craft. Yeah, yeah. And think about it this way: if I just said to you, a banana taped to the wall, you already got it. Yeah. You you don't need to see it. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, there's there's no experience necessarily uh, there that's worth it for me. But, you know, I've long been disappointed in the type of art that I've seen. You, you, I mean, if we could only go back to the days of the Willem de Koonings and the, the true abstractions of those, uh, of, well, the, uh, the action painters and, and the, the New York school, there's a lot there. And those people really struggled and they were doing something. I mean, Willem de Koonings biography, if you ever get a chance to read it, <clears throat> uh, it's a uh an incredible look into that man's life who had a lot of struggles in a lot of ways mostly with mm. poverty mm. um but with alcoholism and um some health problems later on dementia but that was a man who was never really interested in his legacy he was always interested in painting and i could just see some little prick <laughs> walking into a gallery and looking into the Kooning and saying, what a joke. And it's like, you have no idea what you're talking about. You know, mm -hmm. that, that painting is 45 pounds heavier than, than, than its frame because it's sanded down and painted over and over and over again. Um, you can almost think of them like composers. They're composing something much, um, much more maybe subtle and hard. It's something that's hard to appreciate um, unless you really just take the extra time to do it. And there, there is an abstraction or these conceptual art parlor tricks. There is a lot of separating the wheat from the chaff. Mm. And it's not easy to do that unless, you know, I could do it with a PowerPoint and show examples, but, um, the problem well, is that, that, that the curator's job to, to, well, to make the yeah, separation? Yeah. yeah. Um, it should be, but who's the curator? Did they go to art school? Because I'm not, you know. So the problem with abstract art, put simply, is that it's very easy to mimic, but in turn, mm. it's also very hard to master. You know, mm. it's like bowling, you know, it's easy to be good. Yeah. Or darts, you know, it's easy to be good, but to be great, you got to hit the bullseye every single time. Right. It's okay. it's something that just takes more of an eye right now than than people really have to give. We're scrolling past images at the speed of our thumbs, you yeah. know, swiping and swiping and scrolling and scrolling. We don't have time for those images, so it doesn't seem to be a good time to be an abstract painter. And I've struggled this with this uh, myself because I think. I love this mode of expression. I love abstract painting, but if it's just going to fall on deaf ears, 
I don't know what price I would pay if so it's like we said switching styles I mean I I might go a different direction I don't know I sort so, of think damn abstract painting you know what what do you think I guess I don't know if it's at the other end of the spectrum but I think another uh style of art that can be polarizing is like pop art so like Andy Warhol's kind of the the best example do you have it yeah do you have it like a Campbell soup can um or the the Brillo box it's actually I think a pretty cool documentary on HBO it's like a short one it's only like 45 minutes about the Brillo box um mm. and that is is this girl whose parents uh collected art but they would like sell this piece to buy that piece so like she had a brillo box as a kid it was like their dining gotcha. table it was like covered and everything but and then it sold and then they sold it but he signed it with a crayon under it um yeah a red crayon so they could like locate that exact one which was in i don't know what museum but one of the new york museums i believe and uh i don't know i think it's pretty interesting i like i like a lot of pop art but i know it can be a pretty polarizing area i know some people who hate it they think like similar to the red blocks they think it's you know fraudulent <laughs> well the two forebears to pop art were Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns uh, Rauschenberg was using coca-cola bottles mm. you know before Andy Warhol did and Jasper Johns was using soup cans and uh household items in the way of the Brillo box and, and so on and so forth that, you know, Andy Warhol soup cans and things like that. <clears throat> I had an interesting conversation with a friend because I was thinking about Warhol and I was thinking, what did people in his time, going back to the, maybe the, maybe the middle class or the, or, 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 or the, the working class, like, what do they think of a, of a clever young man like Andy Warhol who does these screen prints and these things that are kind of jokey and a little bit uh, cheeky and a little bit um, uh, campy. Um, and I was thinking Andy Warhol might have sort of been like Kanye West is now. Hmm. My friend said, no, uh, you know, how could you say that? And I was thinking, well, Here's someone who a lot of people think is a genius, Kanye West, mm. and Andy Warhol too. But there's a lot of people who see him as sort of a guy trying a little <laughs> too hard to be in the limelight and just a little, little too much. Right. You know, I don't have an opinion on it. I'm just talking about broad, yep, broad strokes. And I said, I bet what would happen if you took a camera in the '60s and walked around Manhattan and asked the bus driver, um, the school lunch lady, the mailman. Like, well, what do you think of Andy Warhol? I doubt they would say, oh, genius. The soup cans? Uh, transcendence. <laughs> Sublime. Yeah. You know, it's like, no. They're going to say, oh, yeah. you mean the weirdo uh, this... who does these... You're going to say, my kid could do that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Andy Warhol had a stroke of genius because... He was mimicking the the the, the production line, you know. Yeah. That's why he called his studio the factory. You know, that's he true. Was, yeah, and they just, show that in the Brillo box doc too. He was just yeah. essentially taking American culture and 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 selling the fat out of their asses back into the soap, just like uh, Fight, Fight Club. Club. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's <laughs> sort of a it's sort of a, <laughs> just playing around. So he's doing that and he's being funny about it, but he's also being very successful. Yeah. But Andy Warhol was also, there's a lot of people who didn't like him. I mean, he seemed to take advantage of people. Yeah. Um, well, some tried like to kill him. <laughs> yeah. Valerie, Valerie Salinas. <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, I don't know. Bob she Dylan said, he, they, who was it? I don't even remember, but um, Susie Rotolo? No, it was one of his wives, and she was messed up in the factory, and he didn't think much of the way that Andy Warhol treated the people. And, no. but you know, I don't know if that necessarily reflects on his art per se, but. Right. Mm. Hey, so do you have any weird, um, like habits in your creative process? Do you have any like weird quirks that, uh, if someone were to see you creating, they'd think, man, this guy's kind of psychotic. Like, do you have any like weird little, uh, quirks or habits at all? 
Um, not necessarily in the process of making work. Hmm. Probably not. Hmm. No, I don't think no. so. Uh, uh, <laughs> I might need a little you... more prodding. I mean, maybe I'm weirder than I think, but no, I tend to, uh, I tend to make a mess. Okay. Do you, right. uh, what, so just to, cause I always bring things to writing. Cause that's what I, that's what I know. And yeah. a lot of people for writers, I'm a habitual writer. I write a minimum of a certain amount of words every day or, you know, every like five, six days a week. Mm -hmm. um, I've, that's how I've been able to, you know, write what I've written instead of, and I guess the, then the other side of that would be like waiting for inspiration, which some people it works for them, but that doesn't work for me. And I actually don't think that's yeah, um, yeah. For, for writing, at least that's not the best route. So right. if you're listening and you're a writer, just be a habitual writer instead and you get more done. But anyway, do you have like, do you treat this like uh, a nine to five or do you have certain time? Do you work at night? Do you work every day or do you wait for more inspiration? And then you might like power through and accomplish a painting or, or, or whatever it is. Um, well, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that <clears throat> I have so many different mediums. Mm -hmm. I, I can, if I don't feel like, maybe I can't write today. I could just as easily maybe pick up the guitar and fiddle around on that. Or, you know, a poem is different than an article for medium. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, I could paint. I could, um, I'm working on a film actually. I'm, I'm Damn, with my right. wife. We're doing a, 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 a film that's, we, we want to make it a feature length film and it's, it's a lot and it's, um, something that's sort of there that I can chip chip away at every day. And so for me, I kind of like to work in a frenzy. Hmm. I like to okay. be a little overwhelmed. Okay. If you just have one story or one project, you might skip it and do something else. But when you feel like, man, if I don't, if I don't get these things done, they're never going to get done and I'm falling behind. Right. Yeah. So I like that a little bit of that panic. Okay. I've heard that too. I've heard that like with, um, some professors, you know, they'd say when I, I had to write every essay or every paper, like the night before it was due or something like that. I I'm the opposite of that. I am a big plan outline, write, You know, get, get it done early. That's just not my style. So, um, but do you think like, if I go too long without writing and I do work, I'm always working on a novel pretty much always. And then I'm, yeah, I've I'm, seen some, I've seen your novels online. I mean, they seem pretty, uh, they seem pretty in depth. Thank you. Yeah. Like, uh, they seem, uh, uh, I would say, um, you know, dense because you go to yeah. strange places with historical, you know? Yeah. Uh, I guess it depends. Um, I mean, I don't want to just talk about my books here, but the uh, one's like semi-autobiographical one is, kind of it's a fantastic element one's a dystopian and one is my first one is kind of a I don't know it, it's maybe on the road like ish and Binge, the drifters Finchel tragedy yeah yeah Finchel tragedy I'm sorry yeah no that, that's yeah. fine yeah that's kind of like a post-college early 20s not knowing what to do it yourself backpacking Europe type yeah thing, plus some other elements to it uh but, when but you anyway go to places like that I mean yeah it begs to be specific in your surroundings. I mean, that takes different cultural references and yeah. you know, traveling is like, you have to take the person there. You can't just say, well, I'm in Paris now. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and, and part of that is, you know, almost everywhere in that book I, I've been to personally, there is one kind of side character who, and we talk, I use this example a lot. So if you listened before, uh, you know, to listeners, they've probably heard this before, but this is, uh, I have a character who's like an Algerian Muslim who mm -hmm. I'm not an Algerian Muslim. I've never, never been to Algeria. And my argument is always, well, so obviously I don't know that, right? I'm not writing what I know there. And if someone read that and found it inauthentic, then they're free to criticize me. That's fine. But the argument is, should I be allowed to write that? And we, Joe and I always argue, absolutely. Like you can write, you can make movies about whatever you want. You can paint whatever you want. You can write whatever you want. But you do open yourself up to criticism if, if it's not authentic or if it's um, kind of derivative or, or whatever, wh whatever it is. Um, I don't know if you have a 
similar. I, I don't know if this would, but you write and you make music and movies. Like, do you have a similar opinion on kind of making whatever you want or basically now it's kind of from the left wing, stay in your lane. You right, can't right. tell the stories of someone else. Um, what, what do you think yeah. about that? Well, that's just an awfully dumb idea. Yeah. 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 You can tell someone because look, um, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg was not in world war two. Right. That's right. Yeah. True. Um, and, uh, there's an infinite list of those types of examples. Uh, yes. One could easily make the argument that to show you how strange the left logic of this is, one could easily make the, ar the argument that no, you're obligated to tell those stories. Hmm. You should hmm. be telling nothing but those stories. I, I think mean, that's also you... what it's, that's, I think that's also what's becoming though. And I think especially writers who are not white or not men or whatever, it's like, Maybe they want to write other types of stories, but they feel pigeonholed. They feel like they have to write about their experience, about their, you know, the term now is lived experience, which is fucking redundant. <laughs> but, um, but like just writing, you know, the if you're gay, you have to write about being gay or if you're black, you have to write about being black. And it's like, well, that's great if they want to, but maybe. And, and, so, and actually on our first episode, Joe and I ever did, we wrote about how it's not even like uh well, white people can't do this, but everyone else can. It's like, no, though, there's a, I mean, why young adult fiction is like the fucking cesspool of the writing world. I can't stand it. But yeah. like, it was a black writer who, who got a lot, not, I, I shouldn't say ca ca caught flack. He literally had his book canceled because he wrote insensitively about like Albanians or Bosnians or something. Yeah, and yeah. he shouldn't have been writing about that, according to the crit logic, as I call it. Um, right, right. So, I, well, I'm, it's, we're totally against it. Yeah, Joe and I are totally against it. And sometimes, yeah. and Joe, I don't mean to cut you off. I just want to use yeah. a right wing example that we talked about recently was Sam Elliott, who I love, who's a, who's a great actor. And he mm -hmm. was giving Jane Campion shit for Power of the Dog. Like, what does this New Zealander know about, like, this New Zealand woman know about writing uh, an American Western? It's like, well, that shouldn't be, that, that shouldn't matter. Her identity yeah. is the work good. Is the yeah. work passable? Is it authentic? If it's not, that's yeah. fine. Then criticize it. But don't criticize yeah. her for making an American Western. Right. So it does come from the other side too sometimes. I, I want to be clear. But sure. vast majority is coming from the left. This, uh, I, I don't know, this, like, cra this craziness of you can only, like, only write what you know to a very specific degree. Well, particularly, sorry, Joe, go, go ahead. Is, you want to say something? Well, yeah, I was going to say real, real quick that, you know, th that mentality is so anti-art. Yeah. It's like you know, I look at a beautiful painting. I go, "Oh, this is amazing. This is really speaking to me." Oh, but you know, the the, the person who did it was a straight white man. Okay, for then forget it. And it's like, well, fuck you. Like, it's does does the piece does it work? Does it when you look at it? Does it speak to you? Does it resonate with you? That's 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 what matters. It doesn't matter uh, of the color of the hand that 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 forged it, that painted it. Hmm. Yeah, there. It's the it's the it's the sport of. Uh, problematization yeah um yeah. we look at something and we say well how could i bend my head so that i'm offended by this right it's got to right. be a way yeah, yeah and so it's it's you know it's just a part of right now the the uh what you guys have talked about this a lot i know is the the wokeification or the the woke culture i'd like to not think of it as wokeification because it implies a certain success on their part but I suppose you'd have to acknowledge it. But uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, those things should be um, left alone. I think yeah. the same way about uh, stand-up comedy. Mm, yes. you know, that's the holy grail of mm. truth. You don't, don't you know yeah. you don't go to hear a comedy show to laugh. You go to hear the truth veiled in humor, so you can swallow it. Right. And and, to, and to be able to it. and to be able to address topics that you can't have at the water cooler or you know at, at the at dinner the table or, or, yeah, yeah the dinner table at the bar and and to, and that's like the beautiful part of it and since really Lenny Bruce Joe and I that was our first kind of profile we do kind of profiles on what we call dangerous artists um since him I get maybe before him but like since him that's been a huge part of the culture talking about all different types of 
would be taboos and right uh the, and if you're afraid i mean i don't even like to say wokeification it's like it's a, it's just fear it's just like a fear culture it's uh it's a red scare type thing where yeah. uh you're you're labeling people you're attack and and no no i i don't believe this is like accountability or any bullshit like that like accountability or justice you know, or whatever or ju no it's not that it, it, yeah. it, uh, we, we always say you're free to criticize it's okay to criticize it's okay you know if something's not authentic it's, to it, it's about removing it okay, like literally canceling it sometimes if it's a show or a movie you can right. cancel it cancel a, a speaker at a university great example let's stick to art right now during the the uh, great awakening, as, as we say, in 2020, there was a San Francisco, I guess he was a curator for one of the big San Francisco art museums. Yes. Was, yeah. Barry, remember this? Barry Glasner or something? I don't remember yeah. the name. I, well, I don't remember the name, but he was basically saying, he, he wasn't even saying like, we're only going to have white artists. He said, don't worry. We're not getting, we're not going to not have any white artists. It's like, right. we're going to, bring in diversity, equity, inclusion, all that shit. We're going to try and diversify, but don't worry, white people, we're not getting rid of white artists and they lost their shit. Yeah, <laughs> they quit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're they, like, they, that's they, right. Like that was too much for them to say, we're not entirely getting rid of the white artists. Yeah. 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 He, he had made the mistake of saying that uh, in public at one of the meetings. Yeah. And he, you're exactly right. He was discussing some DE, DEI initiatives at the, uh, we at say, the we SF say, MoMA. We say yeah. D-I-E here because we, we hope it does. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, a, that's a... Um, he made the mistake of saying, yes, he said, uh, and don't worry, we're still going to have some white artists too. That God was... forbid. God fucking forbid. And he said that as a joke. And <laughs> yeah. they, they wrote to the board and they, they collected signatures and they petitioned him. And uh, later on, he decided to resign. This is the same man, by the way, who was the lead curator of MoMA. Uh, and he was responsible for donating um, uh, an artist piece that we, uh, uh, an artist we mentioned earlier, uh, Mark Rothko, mm -hmm. which was $21 million. I believe it was 21 point something. And uh, he donated that completely to LGBTQIA2IA2P. Uh, how I don't, I can't yeah. do it anymore, but um, <laughs> this track he donated all that money, right? right. So, you're it really... doesn't matter though, it doesn't matter. I, I don't, I, as much as I bring up social credit because I, I do kind of believe it is a thing at the same time, like you could get zeroed out with one sentence, like yeah, you could yeah. be the most, and we call it the term we call on the show is as uh, I call it Robespierre of the week. It's like who got Robespierre this week, JK Rowling's a great. Like you could be so fucking progressive. You could be progressive about every single issue for 20, 30 years. But the second you step out of line, like on one thing, you're not up to date. You use yeah. the wrong term. You don't use the right pronoun, the right, you know, acronym, whatever it is. Heads off. Like, yeah. like right. you're, you're an enemy now. And yeah, so so it doesn't matter. He could, you could have donated $100 million for L LGBTQ causes. It doesn't fucking matter. He said the, the, he said the thing and he's out. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's a movement that um, lacks a sense of humor anyway, because yeah. yeah. you, you could, yeah. they don't take jest as jest. They take it as, as if you had said it seriously. Right. They also don't respond very well to apologies like they seem to imply. Right. We don't, and that's, um, we, we say you don't, you don't apologize. No, you don't. Don't, don't apologize. apologize. Don't don't apologize. Don't. Unless you actually like, so I always give this asterisk. If you actually say something that you think was wrong or it was off the cuff, you disagree, that's fine. It's not, ne don't apologize to to placate the mob. Like, don't apologize yeah. because you're pressured to do it. So it won't work. It's <laughs> blood in the water. Like, right, you're right. feeding into it, you're feeding the monster exactly yeah. what it wants. And so, you know, you go back into, you look at sort of rhetoric <clears throat> and you, you get such, um, let's say, uh, um, course type of call and responses so the, the the situation sort of goes someone said something out of line well they better apologize or you're canceled and they say well i better apologize and then they come out and they apologize and then the next day 
It's, yeah, he came out and issued some half apology, wasn't even sincere. They could be as, sincere, as sincere as possible. Yeah. And yeah. just like you say, it's, it's, it's not going to matter. And that's, I think, a, a natural progression of the ratcheting up of the virtue signaling yeah. to the point where you're so intolerant and you're so willing to take that next step to be above the crowd yeah. that you get completely, um, you get into the, the, the last person, I guess, just hangs themselves type of scenario. Where yeah. And it's kind of ironic. I'm going to bring him up because he's kind of like the godfather of a lot of this like crit bullshit. But I have I've Michel Foucault, you know, the French philosopher, no, uh, no. Discipline and Punish. You know, I have my bookshelf over there. And while a lot of it is, I think, like not really based in fact or science, he does have some good points about um, I just in the beginning of the book, he talks about somewhere in Europe. I don't remember where it was, France or Germany or something like that. <laughs> when there would be the uh, obviously they're executing people all the time for shit, and the uh, accused right would have to, would really they would go in front of you know they'd be paraded through the street of the city, brought in front of brought to like let's say the church, in front of Christ, and would really like be beside themselves in a. Uh, guilt laden way say like like accepting their fate but apologizing and um you know finding some sort of trying to find some relief in that uh and would show true remorse whether what they did was legitimate rape or or com a completely fab fabricate uh, fabricated um uh accusation right whatever right. it is but they would still get executed. Like I think that's I think that's the point is like they want you to grovel and to go in front of obviously not Christ here, but go in front of whatever figures it is, whoever you've offended, Certain whatever group public on. tribunal. Yeah, yeah. A, pub a public tribunal and, and really bear yourself, but they're still gonna execute you. They just want that last they want that last bit of humility. And yeah. you're still you're you're still figuratively executed. You're still out. They're not going to accept you back. You will always. And even if they do, you're always going to have that stain. And the second you step out of line again, well, that stain gets brought up. Not the ten million dollars you gave the LGBT thing, or well, whatever right. activist work you've done, or yeah, exactly. Whatever it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't fucking matter. They yeah. want you. No, so it's not an exact comparison, but I have thought of that. And again, it's ironic because Foucault is like the godfather of all this crazy '70s bullshit, like '60s and '70s bullshit that. Yeah now is the very mainstream which used to be very fringe and now it's like very mainstream yeah that's one of the big problems is that um the same thing with crt yep yeah i mean that's been around since the late 70s and you've had this radicalization at the peripheries and if you think of the long march through the institutions of a kind of silent moving forward through Hollywood, moving through, forward through the universities, through the political institutions, um, uh, even, you know, uh, up, up all the way to the highest institutions you can think of, cultural or political, whatever. The media, the tech. Media, big tech. of course, big tech. Absolutely. So you're absolutely right about the fringe becoming so, so mainstream in these just sort of smacking all at once and people go, where did this come from? And it's like, well, if you've been paying attention to certain parts of culture, maybe, yeah. maybe Hollywood would have been one of, maybe Hollywood was going woke before, you know, we thought in certain ways. Right. I mean, when, when were people at the earliest talking about political correctness? Because that's sort of, an origin term that yeah that was very 90s yeah like I 80s think, early 90s yeah i think yeah. what happened so so hollywood's always been you know it's it's literally based on fiction right like it's 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 either fictionalized stories or it's um remaking history right so like it's always been very progressive in that sense uh but i think most people like that does, they don't really have any power over the everyday person like how like you can watch the movies you don't have to watch their movies my concern is a lot more with like seeing 
sheets coming out like memos at Home Depot or Goodyear talking about not about decentral decentering whiteness and stuff. Like right. these are everyday people that have to deal with this shit. And I think what happened was people not that long ago were saying, oh, no, no, yeah, that shit is like it's a handful of campuses and it stays on campus and once they graduate, they join the real world and it goes mm -hmm. away. It's like that's just not true because those, you know, twenty th those twenty two year olds in twenty fourteen are 30 or 32 now uh, or, or 30 and 35 in their mid thirties going to their forties and they're running companies and they yeah, are the like, CEOs and, and they, right. it's no skin. It's, you know, what, what does it matter to them? It doesn't hurt their bottom line, uh, whether you're a for-profit regular company or you're an NGO or a nonprofit or whatever it is like to tell people to decenter whiteness or to, or, um, you know, you all these pronouns, like using the right pronoun or something like that. And th th that doesn't change their life at all. In fact, they get the social credit points. They get to put the rainbow flag on their Twitter account or the Black Lives Matter or, or whatever it is. Right. And they don't actually don't have to change anything. And actually, when you look at what, uh, you know, I, I always bring up Amazon. I'm a big union guy. I'm like a big labor person. And they will quash union formations in Bessemer, Alabama, that's like 85% black, mm. the employees, but they'll Black Lives Matter at the, on, their, on their home screen. You know, so it's like, <clears> it, it's all virtuous, <throat> but it does affect everyday people because if you step out of line, if you speak out about it, because in this country, freedom of speech also, also includes compelled speech. Like you, you can't make someone say something either. Right. And yeah. And that's, uh, I, I think that's more of my concerns. Like Hollywood's always going to be Hollywood. They've been sniffing their own farts for 70 years. Like that's uh, whatever. It's fine. It's kind of fun, fun to make fun of. You do have some people who may, and, and uh, Joe, our last episode was about the Oscars. We love movies. I always will. I try and separate a lot of them from the art they make. Um, I, and I love some of them, uh, the, the actors, that is, and directors. But my concern is much more about just like, everyday people like people just working at firms and businesses and corporations and stuff that's really disturbing right right yeah i saw that home depot <laughs> yeah yeah that, that came out recently <laughs> and i kind of thought that shit would have ended like yeah. in 2020 but and i do think there has been a good amount of pushback but i mean i see it like i i see shit i won't go into particulars but i heard someone recently this was about Oh, Jesus, like non-binary pronouns, gender, queer, all this stuff. And she goes, yeah, even sometimes I misgender myself. And, I, and I'm like, <laughs> I swear to God. And I'm like, if you misgender yourself, what the fuck chance do we have? Like, like or and, and you this can is a, switch it in the middle of the day. Yeah, but depending on what bracelet you're wearing. Like, <laughs> like this isn't science. This is just, and I mean, like, so we have, we're held to a standard where if we use the wrong gender we're bigots but the person can do it to themselves because like th th this is like this is really this is really fucking scary because there are real consequences besides just like being impolite or being right, right. awkward like having an awkward situation right um so i i, I don't know i'm hope i i think i think to, so is there a response to this the response is like administrations and these universities have to push back you don't have to give in to the 19 year olds it's okay you can be yeah. the adult and i'd say no we're not going to let this crazy thing happen or we're going to let this person speak or whatever it is and you can protest and that's fine like wh whatever like, but yeah my first i think my first uh <clears throat> so i lived in i lived in san francisco uh <laughs> for a long time for about six years when was and that we, say what when was that like what uh, year? that would have been between something like 2010 and 2016. Okay. <laughs> After that, then I lived in Los Angeles for five years. <clears throat> All right. And uh, <laughs> I, I uh, dealt with those types yeah. Yeah. before I even, I, I don't even know if you had, if you, if you had asked me if I knew what a social, social justice warrior was, I assume I could guess by the title, but I wasn't familiar with the, uh, the archetype. Right. Yeah. Um, and I ran into people like that, mostly women, 
who do yep. not like me one bit. <laughs> um, you know, I, I kind of wear cowboy boots and I have a little bit of a Southern swagger and I just look like the fucking patriarchy. They just see me from a, a mile away. And uh, I mean, I've walked into the room, you know, walked into an art gallery and you just see people just, just, wow. yeah. I mean, it's, it was, but I didn't have a word for it and I didn't even know what it was. And it wasn't even that obvious as I just made it, but there was something, a, a, a stink about me. And, um, and I'm, you know, if you have an offbeat sense of humor or something like this, you know, it's not, you're not going to be uh, a friend to those types or they, right. won't, they won't be a friend to you. And so it wasn't until in Los Angeles, I, uh, I actually stumbled across a documentary, sort of a miniature footage type thing. It's pretty thrown together, but it, you, you're probably familiar with the Evergreen College with Brett oh, yeah. Weinstein. And, yeah. You know, yeah. and I saw the footage from there and I just thought, wow, man, it's really gotten out of hand. And I, that was to me where I put a, a, a more concrete idea of what woke was. And the yeah. cynicism, the illogic, the the bullying nature of it. They were chasing him with baseball bats. They're like yeah. looking yeah. around for him yeah. on campus with baseball bats. And I remember, yeah. I remember there was a particular scene where the people in the school could get as close and intimidating and as as ferocious and as 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 uh, bullying as possible to anyone who was either white. Or, or, or a faculty member, or anyone they didn't like. Yeah. Yeah. And this this schmuck of, a, of the president of the school, yeah. this yeah. doofus virgin, is, um, <laughs> is standing up there and he's trying to give a speech and he's doing exactly what, what, what I'm doing. Right, you know, he's he gesticulating just, with his hands. Hey, yeah. guys. And they go, put your hands down, put your hands down. That's physical, uh, you know, that's a microaggression. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And so it, at the heart of this, I think, and it's very fashionable to critique America right now. Um, some, uh, plenty of it deserving, some of it completely ero er erroneous. But at the heart of every movement we have right now, I think, is a crisis of authenticity. You know, you're fake. That's why we don't like your Home Depot printout sheet, because you're a fraud. You're fake. It's a fake movement for fake people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's what I think a lot of it is. It's a yeah. fake movement with fake heroes and fake villains. So people can get in their fake cars and fly their fake flags. Yeah. Go I home think it's more fake uh, shit. I, I don't know who said this. I'm trying to think. And I just heard this quote. I mean, the, the, the sentiment's been out there for a while, but I forget what the quote was, but basically, um, it's we're all humanity we we always need religion and uh this is just the next religion for the for the traditionally uh, a traditional religion is fading whether it's judeo-christian or islamic or hindu like it's just going down in a lot of the western world um that the need for religion in the broadest sense always needs to exist and this is what a subset of the population is catching on to. I mean, they literally, the best example of this was shortly after George Floyd, I, I swear to fucking God, I thought I was watching a dystopian movie. They were carrying a giant raised fist through the streets of Minneapolis, mm -hmm. like, like some, like an icon. Right. And it's like, if that doesn't show you the, and, and what you were bringing up Judson with the evergreen, my favorite picture was this woman sitting, I think this was in DC during, you know, the same craziness of summer of 2020. She's sitting there and there's the flood of, mm -hmm. I'm not even going to call them activists, just psychopaths, you know, <laughs> leaned over her with their fists, like basically telling her, raise your fist, right? Like, like you're not one. It's like, uh, you know, it'd be the same during the fucking Spanish Inquisition. Prove you're Catholic, right? Right. Uh, it doesn't matter. And even if you say it, well, well, we still know you're Jewish. Like, it still wasn't enough, right? It's the same thing. Like, and this woman came out and said, like, I actually supported Black Lives Matter. I just didn't want to raise my fist because I don't like to be told what to do. 
Right. And that was the whole concept. And there's a snapshot of it where they're all, I don't, it's mostly fucking white chicks who's like screaming in her face. But, um, but you know, and, nice? they're, and it's, it's <laughs> you better, and it's like, you better comply or else. And it, that's, that's fucking religion like to a T, like comply to the rules or else. Right? Yeah, I know that uh, uh, John McWhorter yeah. usually has some pretty good religious tie ins. I mean, he made the point, which I thought was, really good that uh you know when religion really had a stranglehold in the world all truth that he he's a linguist so he made the case that yeah i just read his book like like a month ago people would not call it that people would not call themselves religious that word didn't exist then they thought of themselves as truth tellers Mm. so everything every poem every play every opera Every theatrical performance, every painting came down to who's the boss. And the stories they tell have to come down to the religion of the day. And if you think of Hollywood as storytellers, everything has to circle back around to reinforce the point. And so there's definitely (coughs) someone's made the point that it's not really a religion because it doesn't involve the supernatural. Unless maybe you think of obscuring reality to the point where you live in a sort of a place of your own making in a religious type of way but anyway it definitely it definitely has a religious style bullying and a religious style a a religiosity religious type thinking yeah Yeah. the way the way it messes with words like I, i i brought this up with uh i mean like kendi and he made up a term right anti-racist playing off well let's let's start from the beginning we're taught from very young age rightfully so that racism is bad it's kind of a like racism is bad we all know that you should not be racist and my definition of racist is treating people differently based on the color of your skin right that's kind of been the racism what racism meant for fucking years this guy comes along and says well actually actually white people it's not enough to be not racist must be anti-racist and a big group of white people went well i know racism is bad and i want to not be that thing and this person is telling me well you have to be actually this thing to be that you must be this well you know truth sayer how do i do that well, lucky for you, I wrote a whole book about it. Yeah, I wrote a whole book about it. And, and I also charge $20,000 an yeah. hour. Uh, yeah. to be, to I mean, it's, and, I, and what I've said is I love what my favorite kind of subcategories of culture is like the swindler and fraudster and snake oil salesman, especially American. It's like, mm, it's like part of our DNA. And I mean, this yeah. is just the late, this is just one of the latest iterations of it. I, I mean, you there see, with the, the mega church and. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. It's, it's same coin, Joel Osteen. It's, it's the same fucking thing. Uh, and, and but this one seems so much more blatant to me. I mean, televangelists, yes, are very blatant too. But you'll you'll see these. I don't even want to give them credit for being DIE coordinators, but they'll be up there with their fucking board or whatever, and their Venmo account will be right there. It's like they're not you're not even hiding it. Yeah. Like you're like, you're not even fucking hiding. Be like white people are bad. <laughs> Here's my Venmo account. And well, I mean, um, that's also a product of American type thinking. Yeah, I, I, that's what I'm saying. This is very, I think this is very American. I know that they have iterations of it in the UK and Australia. And I know France, ironically, is bitching about it because it's like, well, you guys are the ones who started this. Simone de Beauvoir and Michel Foucault and Sartre. Like, you guys all kind of were the groundwork for this. Um, but, but we just kind of took, like most, like very American of us, we just take it and fucking export it to the world and make it bigger yeah. and flashier. But uh, I think I think this is very American. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I think it's uniquely American in, in a way. Um, this sort of, uh, like I said, this sort of unctuous snake oil salesman who uh, plays off of people's like the the fire and brimstone pastor used to do in the 18th century, 17th century during the, the Great Awakening. Uh, playing off the fear of hell and internal damnation. This is playing off of racism because we've been told, ground into us, racism is bad. Racism is bad. Well, it is. We we know that. But you're being racist, even though you don't think you are. Just like you're sinning, 
you're going to hell, even though you think you're doing everything right, you actually have to do these things. And it's, it's very, very similar. Well, I mean, and that that's when I get so concerned when I see colleges not pushing back on these stupid dipshit kids. Like, you know, uh, bring it back to art. You know, I, I think uh, I don't know if you guys guys heard about this from a couple of years ago. Um, Yale, uh, like one of their like uh, flagship courses, I think it was like an introduction to Western art. And it was super popular for like several decades. And then, uh, you know, a bunch of kids got offended by it because they thought it wasn't diverse enough. Um, so they ended up scrapping it and, and then replacing it with more diverse artists of color, women, uh, artists and things like that. And, but, but, but the administration, they, they bowed down immediately. They didn't say like, Hey, no, this class has been around for decades. And it's well, yeah, that's the top problem. Classes. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's crazy that, 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 you know, and, 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 and I wonder if, uh, Judson, if, 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 if you have any insights into this, but if, if like, you know, if, if these, these dipshits are like. You know they're going to the prestigious universities, and they're, you know, they ha do, like do they have much of an influence on you know art, you know, in, in the art world, saying, well, this is, it's a nice piece, but it wasn't diverse enough, or something like. Like, are, are you seeing this creeping into you know the art gallery world at all? Oh, for sure, one hundred percent. You're in the eye of the storm, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah um, <clears throat> uh, particularly L.A. Yeah. Pretty. Uh, a fair amount in San Francisco, but <clears throat> you have in LA essentially a whole population of, of, of art students um, uh, masquerading uh, as activists. Yes. Or maybe the other way around. I right. can't tell. Yeah. But um, yeah. they don't, neither of them do either one uh, uh, very um, convincingly. Yeah. Yeah. And so there was an artist I remember there who made these cruddy the cruddiest type of clay sculptures uh, but she just spelled out things sort of like something like almost like the rugrats logo oh yeah yeah cruddy clay mm, you know pink and and she would spell out things just like smash the patriarchy yes you know just mm -hmm. these these bumper sticker isms right and right. yeah i uh I got to the point where when I was in LA, I mean, I, I lived in LA for five years. I mean, I lived in my car, yeah. you know, I struggled a lot, you know, I, I had jobs too. I mean, I managed a jazz club and I had a, a really great studio there where I lived. And the atmosphere in LA was so diseased yeah. for me. Um, we all know that LA can be, uh, fairly um, superficial. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and people tell you that before you go. And I had been there before and uh, not long enough to gauge the temperature of the atmosphere. But I thought, well, it's a big city, you know, I mean, you're going to mm -hmm. find your crew. You're going to, you're going to, there's good people everywhere. But, <laughs> but no, I think I was wrong. It, there was, there was <laughs> in the art world, it was, it was, it was just, toxic i mean there was literally yes. a show i remember one person uh it's a pretty well-known gallery but i haven't been there in in a while so I, i'm not going to be able to think of the name of the gallery but it, it was it was a fairly well-known gallery that had launched some careers of several people and it was sort of like um calling all artists it was like people of color gay bi queer transgender i mean it would have been easier to say no white straight males. Right. You're yeah, not right. hearing us. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and it was just sort of like blatant discrimination. <clears throat> There's not a single art student um uh in Los Angeles that hasn't learned to weaponize yeah. whatever type of victimization they have. Yeah, you no, have, you're you're right. If you have a a, a, a black trans woman in a wheelchair she makes black trans wheelchair art yes. there's not a chance in the world she paints landscapes sorry right. Right. not gonna happen no yeah I, and i actually I, I saw that dichotomy at the hammer museum which is part of ucla i think um and i was i was there a few months ago and you there like there was the, the difference between actual artists and like student activists 
artists. I mean, it's night and day. So at, at the gallery, you know, they, they have some actual like original paintings from French uh, 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 impressionists, and and so like and the, the gallery just donated just to you know historical paintings, and so you're walking around and you're seeing all this beautiful ornate influential art, and then you go to like the gallery right next door to it, you know, all, you know, all all in the same complex at the, at the Hammer Gallery, and um, it's just ugly, deranged political activist art. Like so, so you go from seeing like these beautiful portraits and landscapes to, uh, I'm, I'm going to take you know uh, 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 some 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 images from Hustler magazine and then spray paint all over it, and then I'm going to take some, and then the spray paint you patriarchy over it, and it's like okay, that, that's it. They, 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 it's first of all, it's, it's just aesthetically bad, um, and it's political, and it's also very simplistic in its in, in its politics. It's not even complex or interesting or provocative. It's no, it's just like that's what you that's your politics right there. The patriarchy is dead or whatever. Yeah, you're not supposed to just write like words <laughs> on something. Right. Um, <clears throat> that's not really the the process that you would think you would go through. Right. But, you know, if you can't define art, you're going to have a really hard time defining good art. Yes. And so what happens in a place like L.A. is that you get a part of your in-group and it's basically just friends of friends. Mm. And it's very cutthroat in that way. There's a lot of artists who are very quick. This is more of a craft issue than a woke type thing, but sure, sure. who are very quick to um, very quick to mimic what a successful artist would do. So you have some person who's been painting for three years out of art school, and all of a sudden they're curating, mm. and they've sold a few paintings, and now they're hiring a studio assistant to stretch their canvases. <laughs> it's like, you've got to really be kidding yourselves. Right. Um, I've never seen so many robotic type of people um, as the artists I did in, 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 um, in uh, Los Angeles. I mean, uh, they were quite a repulsive, ugly, ugly crowd of people. Yeah. Um, you'll let me know if I'm being too subtle. <laughs> uh, I did not enjoy that environment at all. Right, right. And another thing just about LA and its superficiality, yeah. I had a lot of negative interactions with individuals. Mm. Um, I had a, uh, a particular curator writer who was trying to work with me. Um, and she was on the woke side, but we hadn't gotten that far yet. And I could mm. tell something was off about her like this, I don't know. She wanted to uh, help promote my work in some meaningful way, but we were having trouble getting there. And she then found my book online called American Pleasure, which was my fir the first novel that I wrote. And um, she said, well, I found your book online, American Pleasure. And she said, I'm just, I'm just worried about working with you because it sounds like it might be offensive. <laughs> And I thought, yeah, you know, it <laughs> might this, be. Yes, it's gonna it, work. Might, it just might be. It's funny that that would be your first concern because it yeah. feels automatic. But anyway, that and about a dozen other experiences, all of those negative experiences did revolve around narcissism, yeah. a flakiness, an inauthenticity, yeah. a person who thought they uh, pretended they were going to do something for you, although they were looking for you to do something for them. And once they realized you weren't that person, they, they moved on. Yeah. So there was a lot of false starts. People promising to come to my studio didn't come. People just, um, well, you live in, in LA, Joe. Yeah. Um, what part of town do you live in, by the way? Uh, I live in Highland Park. So that's Park. Northeast, in Northeast LA. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. No. Yeah. I used to hang, I used to go, there was a bowling alley there. They used to have an open mic night, a pretty cool, like, cocktail yeah. lounge bowling alley. Highland Park Bowl, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what um, it was. I live right down the street from there, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's a really cool part of town, it's, man. I like that part of town. Cool. It's, it's quaint, yeah. but you don't figure LA for particularly. Yeah. yeah. But how long have you been there? Uh, almost two years now. So I moved, like, uh, in, in July 2020. Oh, Jesus. You moved, like, right when I left. No, really? <laughs> I could have yeah, told you. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you like it, though? I mean, um, he does do. like it. Yeah, do. he loves it. I, I fucking love L.A., but here's the thing. Like, I, 
part of the reason why I love it is 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 because I hate it in many ways. Like, there are many <laughs> things to hate about it, and with, maybe because like I, you know I'm just I, like there's like this sort of rebellious rock and roll side of me, where it's like when I move in, like moving into a place that's very woke and very uptight and very clicky, and I just kind of like cool like this is a great opportunity to be the Rodney Dangerfield coming into a very posh superficial party like hey guys what the fuck's going on hey let's party huh like it's like well, maybe they need you in a sense i, not, I, kind I, of, I yeah. appreciate not that but you know what i mean like they could use a dose of a few characters like that exactly where it's like okay cool like there there are rules to break here um so i'm like cool like i, yeah. I think th so i think in many ways it's a great time to be an artist um because like you know i i think some of the greatest works of art and when i say art in this context i mean broadly speaking so film literature paintings, poetry, whatever, the stand sure, comedy yeah. even. Um, I think some of the greatest works of art were dangerous and offensive and provocative in their own time. Uh, you know, pe people yeah. couldn't quite separate the genius <clears throat> part from like the superficial, you know, uh, offensive <clears throat> part. And now we look back and go, oh, you know, I'm glad that Lenny Bruce came out and started making jokes about hookers and cocaine. I'm glad that this writer wrote about sex in that way. And I'm glad that this movie came out and broke down the boundaries. Um, but you know, we you don't realize at the time. So for me, I'm like, sweet, this is this is virgin territory. Just like kick open some doors and just kind of make yourself at home. Yeah, Ben, uh, you uh, you mentioned that your work was uh, semi autobiographical, and you mentioned the way a writer writes about sex. One of my big mm. heroes in life is a, a, a writer by the name of Henry Miller. Do you have any yeah, thoughts on can him? Tropic of Cancer, of course. Yeah, yeah, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, yeah, yeah, Texas, Plexus, and Nexus. Yeah, uh, um, so, Bosch. <clears throat> yeah, one of I, I'm so one of my one of my books is openly like semi, I'd say semi autobiographical. My my second book, uh, and which one was that? That one's called Lunch Meat. So I that, like the cover of that one a lot. Oh, it's a good cover. Yeah, what was it the Neon God? Was it the Neon God? The Neon that's yeah the neon god that's my third book and probably like actually i shouldn't say probably i know exactly how much it might like by far my most successful it's it's the one that like sells regularly so that's good um that's amazing that one yeah that's good that that one's about the greek god uh dionysus coming to new orleans because I, I lived right. in new orleans for a few years and yeah uh kind of there's like a niche market for it because there's a big greek god mythology kind of pe like people are really into that and that was kind of that was my first book that had like more of a defined um genre like like the other two were kind of more broad new adult fiction coming of age well that's pretty broad but this one had a more kind of defined genre so there's been a more of a market for that nice so you like henry miller <laughs> yeah yeah i do i have tropical cancer on my bookshelf back there yeah so. i mean he's one of the writers where you were talking about going off and getting some experience Yes. Jesus. I mean, I I just I love reading about Henry Miller and I, I will read anything he has to say. The type of courage that it takes to live his type of life is something that I could that you know I would aspire to. Yeah. I mean, he's one of the people that you know, I think it was I think it was Picasso who said, and this would this would be the guy to say it. Henry Miller is sort of the Picasso of the literary world. In the mm. sense that Picasso was a successful painter, but he was probably also the most successful at being a bohemian. Mm -hmm. I mean, he started so many things that people don't even realize. I mean, people weren't even hanging out in the south of France hardly until, you know, there was just some lifestyle choices and an attitudinal aspect of the grit that mm. is something that, I think people should pay more attention to uh, artists, at least or writers, and uh, really get to know uh, get to know the people that I like. So I think they should do. Oh. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Well, um, probably start wrapping up soon, but I, I do have a, a question for you, uh, Judson. Um, what is the most dangerous advice that you can give to an aspiring artist? Uh, probably don't take advice. Oh, all right. There you go. Cool. That probably feels pretty dangerous because you're going to have to make your own mistakes. Not to take not any advice at all, maybe, but probably don't take too much of it. Mm. Um, yeah, something like that. No, no. 
Do you think that artists should kind of uh, tailor their work towards, I don't know, like marketability or just put it out there and, and, and find the market and it'll go, it'll, it'll go farther and you get to kind of keep, I guess, like more of a piece of yourself that way instead of just kind of making what yeah. other people sell. When, when J.D. Solinger was asked about Catcher in the Rye, he said he didn't think anybody would ever publish it because no one would understand it. And so then yeah. you realize, well, that's how he thought about it. Yeah. That book gave a voice yeah. to millions of people of a generation, still could. Yeah, I remember it's, when one, it's one of my favorite books. My English teacher, uh, I don't know what grade it was, probably freshman year, things when we read it. And she said, this is going to be a great book for a lot of you. And she pointed me out. She said, especially you. I didn't know what that meant. I hadn't read it yet. But, uh, I, uh, I like Tolden Caulfield, you know. But so he took the, the best way is to the, the individual becomes universal because people don't want to see the universal. They want to see themselves in the individual. Sure. Yeah. So if you if you make it into a lukewarm project that appeals to everyone, People are going to feel that. But if you make some weird, weird character that you don't think anyone would know, that might be their inlet because no one is like that character yeah. and no one is like the person reading the book, at least in their mind. Right. So there's opportunities there. So I always think, you know, <laughs> shoot yourself out of a cannon and just see where you land. It's not, um, it's not really up to you anyway. And, uh, even if you try to make it marketable, that doesn't mean it would work. So now you just have an inauthentic piece that still doesn't sure. sell. So yeah. I think the best way is to just, um, you know, was it, uh, I use this quote from James Baldwin. He said, uh, mm. you know, the artist must tell the whole story. He must tell the complete truth. He must vomit the anguish up. Mm. And I use that quote as an opener for my first book, American Pleasure. Uh, mm -hmm. because that's how I felt. And the book is quite personal and quite, uh, well, um, you know, salacious and not something that I would be talking about at the dinner table, but yeah. I don't um, let my parents read my books. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. They're so like, can we go. finally read one? I'm like, not yet. <laughs> no, I understand. I understand completely. Yeah. But that's ultimately the, the, sort of the price. I mean, that, I, well, maybe it's not even a price, but it's sort of your responsibility in a way. Um, unless you want to make Hallmark cards and commercials or something right. like that. So right. you really have to figure out what type of artist you want to be. And you might just be a graphic designer that makes nice advertisements for people. And that's sort of what I do with canvas graphic design. I, I'm not yeah. there to be the pure artist that I am or that I try to be when I'm painting or when I'm writing, but I'm trying to collaborate with other artists in a very practical way to give them something real. Yes, but isn't just me. Right. So you might find different areas where you can do certain things and not others. But uh, I always think just be, be an open book and vomit the anguish up. And yeah. people, that's what people want to see. They want to see your vomit. So there's a great, you, Oh, sorry. So go, go ahead, Joe. Uh, there's a great quote from uh, uh, director David Cronenberg. He says, uh, the artist's only responsibility is to be irresponsible. And I love that where it's like, yeah, just go out and be messy yeah. and, and be what you are. Like, don't, don't, don't polish it too much. And don't, don't try to placate this group and give something that everybody can like. No, it's like, just go out there and fuck up a little bit and see what happens. Yeah. Right. So, uh, I'm sure we've all done a lot of fucking up so yeah that's good. so and you you make so you make book covers for like independent writers right like they, well they, I, I practiced because i made so many of my own yeah because i was designing my own book covers not because i needed to but, but who else was going to do it and uh i thought well i could do this canvas graphic design thing with sort of a i guess sort of a bent towards uh, you know, painting and collage and, and sort of fine art in a sense, hence canvas. Um, but we've done some, it's me and me and my wife, Yasmin, mm. we've had this business and it's slowly getting better, but we do book covers for poets and, and, and authors. And we've done some movie posters. We've That's done, great. um, we, uh, album covers. So 
it's sort of a side project that might allow me to do some things that I wouldn't normally do and maybe interact with some artists that I wouldn't normally interact with. Well, I'll be in touch with you about that. I told Joe right before I'm like, yo, his book covers are awesome. Like I Thank you. Uh, like, and I'm always working. My, my next book is just going to be the, um, I'm doing a series. I'm going to take a break after this next one. So it's going to be part two of a series. So I'm just going to use that artist because it's going to match. Right. But after that, you know, I'm always looking for uh, a book cover designer and like, it's great, great to know. I mean, we'll be in touch for other stuff. Yeah. Too. We'll be in touch anyway. Cause I really like what you guys are doing. I really like the, the medium stuff Thank you. Uh, as well. And I'll try and pay some, uh, you know, I was reviewing your books uh, a couple of days ago and, uh, uh, I want to pay more attention to that too. So I think there's a, oh, you know, we'll collaborate on something, but there's a lot of room Definitely. for, for us to talk and a lot more to talk about. So, uh, yeah. you'll be seeing me around and I'll be commenting and, uh, clicking around and, uh, oh, hopefully we're, I'll, we'll do this again if you'll have me back. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely man. And, and we're, yeah. we're Twitter monsters. So you'll see us, you can even join. Yeah, we're, I do. I do. I do. We're, we're Twitter <laughs> monsters. And, and uh, uh, we'll definitely have you back on. We love having, uh, uh, guests back on. Yeah. For sure. And so for our listeners, um, you know, uh, uh, I first yeah. stumbled upon Judson, you and I, we met uh, through, through Medium because because you submitted some some great stories to the publication, um, yeah. which we'll definitely link to in the the uh, the YouTube uh, this video description there. Uh, but uh, yeah, man, let's do this again. This is great. We love your work um, and we'd love to help promote you, help spread the word out there. And uh, yeah, um, uh, so if you just tell our listeners where to find you. Um. Well, my website, I suppose, judsonvereen.com. Um, I could I could maybe send you some links if you link stuff. I could maybe help you out with some of the links or something. But uh, yeah, judsonvereen.com sure. is a comprehensive sort of merging of, of, you know, my music and acting things that I've done and just all my projects. I just threw it off on one thing and it could give you a, a deeper understanding of where I'm coming from, I suppose. But that's where I would start. And it links off to Medium and, and, and YouTube and Twitter yeah. and whatever awesome. but yeah if there's anything uh that i can do for you guys in the future uh you let me know i'll be happy to promote you or talk about you or you know make a book cover some whatever whatever yeah definitely man awesome. and we'll, we'll see you on the uh burning hellscape that is twitter yeah i want to <laughs> I, uh, I want to come back so yeah say hello to LA and new jersey we'll talk again yeah. to you guys all right thanks, yeah, thanks, a lot, thanks so much man good night gentlemen see ya